Well, once again, good morning. Uh, you've heard about the dynamics of our morning around here. They've been uh, interesting, to say the least. It's always a uh, memorable thing. We can describe it that way. When you receive a message around 6.15, hey, you need to call me, from the person who's scheduled to teach that morning. Oh, this is probably not a positive message that's about to be shared. Um, but I do thank you for uh, praying for Pastor John. Um, I know he'll get better. I said, you know, it is a summer at Coastline Series. We could get you like an eye patch, a little hat. We could make it kind of like a thing to, to kind of like, yeah, to kind of close out the series. But he, uh, he said, no, I'm not into that. So, all right, that's okay. Um, but it's been a fun series this summer. We've welcomed a number of guests. If you're a guest this morning, um, we, we typically find ourselves as a church working through books of the Bible. But for the last month and a half or so, We've been doing something different just through the summer where we've invited kind of, I guess you'd call it some of the family, like friends and family from the local Gulf Coast who pastor churches in this area that we're personally connected to, to bring a message of what God's been doing in them and they could share it through the word of God to us on a Sunday morning. And it's been a joy to welcome some of those guys from Destin, Navarre, Pensacola, um, just been a wonderful thing to hear from them as they've opened up God's word to us. And as was mentioned, Pastor John was going to bring our last teaching this morning in that series. Next Sunday, we begin our jump back into the book of Revelation. So for me this week, that's kind of where my head has been, walking through judgment. Revelation 6 through 19. Not just judgment, but mercy. I'm extremely excited in this fall to walk through a series that we're entitling Jesus Full of Justice and Mercy, because that's truly what we see in the book of Revelation. But we'll begin that next week. So for this morning, you've got your Bibles. I want to encourage you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just going to give kind of a standalone message this morning to finish out this summer series. And the message is entitled, Standing Strong in Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Always the answer at church, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we plan to look at the first 10 verses. And many of us this morning, many of us, as I look around the room and recognize so many familiar faces, many of us have known Jesus, walked with Jesus, loved Jesus for many years. Some of us here this morning, maybe we haven't. Maybe, maybe we're not there, but it's my hope and prayer that you would come to know Jesus, the way, the truth, the life, the Savior of the world, the one who's designed you, who knows you, who's planned for you, is good. My hope for all of us in our time together this morning is that we would know the Lord, and know how to stay with him, know how to stand with him as we walk through life. Now, if we've had the opportunity to connect in any fashion, you know that I have that addiction of alliteration, right? Six kids, our dog's name doesn't begin with L, but it's got two in it, that kind of thing. Well, this morning, we're going to consider at least, at least eight dynamics from 1 Thessalonians 3 that I believe lend themselves to this desired end. Here's the goal. I want to stay in love with Jesus. I don't want a religious experience about him. I want a relational experience with him. I want to stay in love with him. I want to stick with him. I want to stay with him. I want to stand with him. I believe there's at least eight, eight dynamics from this chapter that lend itself to that end, to stay in love with the Lord, to walk with him. Let me list them for you. Because this is like 45 minutes of notice before the sermon needed to be ready, I don't have them all up on the screen. So this is a wonderful opportunity to like, for those that have that mental capacity just to memorize everything or to jot down some notes. But here they are. Let me share them with you. Verse one, compassion and care are necessary. Verse two, character. Verse three and four, challenge is a part of the process. It's necessary. Caution from verse five, communication from verse six, 
consistency from verse 7, comfort from verses 7 and 9, and cheer from verse 10. Did you get all those? Okay, don't worry. You're going to get them later. They're going to come one at a time. At least eight dynamics that are from God's word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, that are part of the process of sticking and staying with Jesus, standing with him, staying in love with him. So this morning, we'll walk through these 10 verses. And here's my hope, that you would have all eight of these memorized and in practice before you darken those doors on your way out today. No. I mean, I think it'd be wonderful if, if all these integrate themselves into our lives. But here's my hope. My hope is that God would speak to you on at least one, at least one of these dynamics in this way. This would be instruction or encouragement or correction or even as God's word is so faithful to do according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, loving rebuke. This is why we come to God's word for instruction, for encouragement, for correction, and even for realignment. That's what God's word does. My hope as we navigate these 10 verses together is that God would speak to you in that fashion. And one of the values that we have here as a church is not just to learn God's word, but to learn it so that we could live it. That's why God's word is given, so that it would actually have impact upon our life. Father, I ask in humility this morning that I would be able to serve you by serving your people well in the explanation and instruction that comes from your word. God, I, I know who I am. I know I'm not worthy to open your word. I know I don't have the capability to do this in and of my own strength. So Lord, I just ask by your spirit, for the sake of your word, for the sake of your people, that you would speak clearly. And God, that I'd be able to serve you well in these next few moments that we have together. Bless this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1. This is Paul writing to a church that he loves. He says, finally, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy to you. It's kind of an interesting place to pick up a text this morning. Let's get a little bit of context for this first lesson from God's word, and that's compassion or care. We know a little bit of the context around this letter. Paul, that New Testament apostle, that, that serial church planner, he had to leave Thessalonica, the area in which these people resided, to whom he's writing, because of the opponents of the gospel would have killed him had he stayed. And he and his team went to Berea, but persecution followed there as well. Paul's writing a letter to these Christians in Thessalonica. The situation, the dynamics around him aren't necessarily favorable or encouraging. But where's his mindset? Where's his heart? Verse 1, when I could stand it no longer, we decided to stay in Athens, and so we sent Timothy to you. I want to connect with you, he's saying. Here's the dynamic for Paul that you find out so consistently through the letters that he writes in the New Testament. For Paul... People were not tasks nor projects. They weren't the drawback to his ministry in life. But they were his pride and his joy. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2, right there in, in 1 Thessalonians. He says very simply, You are our pride and our joy. One of the greatest places to be rich in life is not in the length of your boat that resides in one of the harbors. That's my pride and joy. One of the greatest places to be rich in life are not in the experiences you may be able to engage in throughout life. The greatest and most rewarding experiences in life are relationships. Relationships. Paul writes to these individuals whom he loves, and he says, listen, you... You are my pride. You are my joy. Paul cared for people. He had compassion for people. Many of you might know that the New Testament wasn't written in English, but Koine Greek. And this chapter 
opens up with these words, therefore or wherefore, meaning in light of the tenderness that Paul had for these people, he writes. And the words that he uses are very descriptive. Verse one, he says, left or stay, which gives this connotation of leaving someone at death. He's like, when we left you, that's what it felt like. In chapter two, verse 17, he says that he felt separated from them. In in the Greek, that word means bereaved. See, for Paul, the relationships that he experienced in life, they weren't just tasks. They weren't just potential contacts. These were people that he genuinely cared about. That when he left them, there was this sense of bereavement, this sense of loss. Listen to what Paul wrote to a church in Philippi, another church, another group of people that he loved dearly. I'll just read it to you. It comes from Philippians chapter one, verse three. He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. I love this about Paul, that he cared for people. Now to the church in Corinth, he loved them. Even though, well, listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 12. I'll just read it to you. It comes from verse 15. He says, I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. You ever felt like that with some people, maybe? Man, you guys are amazing. You never feel that way. Well, you do. Okay. This is Paul's dynamic with some. He's like, man, the more and more I give, it seems like the dynamic the less and less you love me. Now, you may say, I can relate to that. It seems like the more I give, the less people give back. But I don't want to be there, you might say. I want to be in a healthy place. I don't want to to be burdened by the hurt of unhealthy relationships with unhealthy people. I don't want to be so wounded by people that I can't enjoy life. Listen, life can be challenging with people. And sometimes, at times, certain people can be at the center of that. You say, how do I navigate that? I don't know. Call Pastor John Spencer when his eye gets better. Ask him. He's got the wisdom for it. No, I would say this. Sometimes it's wise and necessary for there to be a healthy distance from unhealthy people. At times, that's the case. Other times, we need to learn and grow through it and learn to love who Jesus loves. And at other times, it just takes time, perspective, practicing forgiveness to navigate the inevitable hurt and sometimes loss that can come in loving and serving people. But you have to know something about this. You're not alone in this. Paul writes to this church in Corinth, the more I love you, it seems like the less you love me. But know this. Jesus sees everything. Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes this to a a group of Christians in Galatia. He says, don't grow weary in well-doing. You'll reap if you don't lose heart. In relationships, give everything but up, right? Invest, care, and do what God's called you to do. Don't don't put more upon you than what he's put upon you. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says this, as much as depends upon you, be at peace. Relationships are a two-way street. There has to be that willingness and that dynamic and that heart to want to be in relationship for there to be peace. So don't place a burden upon yourself that God hasn't placed upon you, but as much as depends upon you, be at peace. Serve, forgive. And when you give your life to love the people Jesus loves, here's what I've found. He cares for you better than anyone else could. Trust him. Love people and leave the results to him. He knows. See, listen, if you want to stand strong with Jesus, care and compassion are necessary. Loving people. Life lived to the fullest is only ever a simple overflow in the love that we've received from God. 
if you're looking for that to reciprocate into people, you're always going to be coming up to an empty well. But you say, listen, the love that I get for people comes from him. It comes from him and who he is. The truth of those songs that we just sang, that's what solidifies the love that we have in our hearts. It comes from him. Care and compassion is not derived by looking horizontally, but vertically. God, what you've done, the things that you've done, my future is heaven. My sins are forgiven. And here's the thing about caring for people. Something I'll tell my kids quite often. I'll say, you know, guys, caring for people, it doesn't necessarily take a high IQ, but a clear EQ. EQ, a frequency, a clear heart in which you have a relationship with God where you know who you are. You know what he's called you to do. A sensitivity to the Lord. And just serving them because you love him. That's how you develop that care and that compassion. It's a sensitivity of heart before the Lord. Not necessarily a high IQ. Well, I know this, I know that, this situation, that. No, Lord, I, I want to listen to your voice. I want to trust you. And I want to be obedient to what you've called me to do in care and compassion. Now, in verse 2, listen to what he says. He says, because of this care and compassion, verse 2, we sent Timothy to you. He's our brother. And God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you and to encourage you in your faith. Number two, if you're keeping notes today, the, the second point we see is this element of character. Character. We know from the New Testament that Timothy was not a perfect guy. Struggled with some things. Maybe his ability to lead the church. But one thing we do know is that he was a man of character. And we're given a, a simple but significant description of Timothy here. Paul says, listen, Timothy's a brother. He, he's a co-worker, meaning he's able to bring encouragement and strength to those who need it. He's a brother. What does that mean? He's genuine. He's a worker. He's not lazy. And he's a co-worker, meaning it's not all about him. He's a team player. One author says this, Timothy was a good team man. He was a fellow worker. He did not try to run the show by himself and get people to follow him. He was a fellow worker with other believers. He obeyed Paul and left Athens for Thessalonica. Sounds like simple stuff, right? Like Timothy, he's genuine. He's a brother, part of the crew. He's a worker that when there's a task to be done, you can trust him to give his best effort. And he's a co-worker, meaning it's not all about him getting the credit. It's about being a team player who knows how to be under authority and in authority. We call that character. And it seems like in the 21st century, character is rising to the surface, especially in the church world, as a necessary quality that needs development. See, so what do you mean by that? I want to share with you an article I recently read on this topic of character. This author writes this. People get hired and promoted on talent, potential, track record, and competency. The culture and marketplace reward competence when they see it, and arguably they should. But I don't think competency alone will keep you there. The roadside is littered, this author says, with bodies of people who are great at what they did, but neglected who they were. Pro sports, the church, Hollywood, Wall Street, all have witnessed so many incredibly gifted people who fell because of things like drugs or affairs, theft, embezzlement, inability to get along with others. He says, here's what I increasingly believe. Competency starts something that only character can finish. And here's the tension. I sometimes think the key to my future development is competency. I just want to get better at what I do. I want to be a better leader or communicate more effectively or motivate teams to a higher level. And he says, that's all good. But one slip up in character could undermine it all. One bad move, one momentary indiscretion, one systemic compromise could undo what all the competency in the world could create. Your capacity can only take you as far as your character 
can sustain you. So the question is this, what are you doing to develop your character? What are you doing to nurture your heart, your soul, and your integrity? That's what will sustain your gift in the long run. As I read that article, I thought about this individual, Timothy. Timothy's description that Paul gives of him, listen, he's a Christian. Don't you think that's a good thing for a pastor to be? (laughs) I think that's a great place to start. Like he doesn't start to say, have you read the books he's got? Have you seen the following online? He says, you know what? He's a brother. He's a Christian. There's genuineness there. He'll work and he'll work well with others. I don't know if you've ever owned a business or ever been out of business or ever been anywhere, but don't you think someone who's genuine works and works well with others are awesome qualities that are increasingly hard to find? These are simple things for Timothy, but these are the things that he takes note of. And if you've read any bit of the New Testament, Titus or Timothy, when when Paul's seeking to give instruction to some of these new pastors about the kind of leaders to look for in a church, every single element of the job description is about their character, except for one. When it comes to an elder, they've got the ability to teach. That doesn't mean they have to do it well, but they just have to have the ability. Here's what I'm trying to say. Character matters in standing strong with Jesus. Character matters in your marriage. It matters with your kids. It matters in the marketplace. It matters in the church. It matters. It matters everywhere. You could put it this way. Competency gets you in the room, but character is what allows you to stay there. And if you want to stand strong in Jesus, character are one of those elements that he's constantly working on in your life. Can anyone resonate with that? That it seems like God's very faithful to try and work on your character. Anyone ever experienced that? Yeah, he seems very, very consistent on that. And you've heard the old adage, God's more interested in your character than your, rhymes with Mumford. Comfort, right? Like sometimes he'll use uncomfortable dynamics to work on that character. Here's what you're learning so far from 1 Thessalonians. Boy, it seems like relationships matter. And just simply doing that right thing that God has in front of me. And he's faithful to give opportunities to grow in both those things, compassion and character. Now, if you look at verses 3 and 4, you see why Paul sent Timothy to these Christians in Thessalonica. He says in verse 3, And to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through, but you know that we are destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come, and they did, as you well know. So just a bit of review. Standing strong in Jesus involves care and compassion. That's point number one. It involves character, point number two. But we also must recognize that there's great challenge in life, in serving Jesus. Paul writes here in verses three and four, listen, You are destined for glory. No, well, what he says is you're destined for troubles. I've heard of ministries built on the destiny God has designed for you, but I've never seen this verse attached to that phrase. Life is challenging. It's hard. In the words of theologian Jimmy Dugan, do you know Jimmy Dugan? It's supposed to be hard. It's the hard that makes it great from that movie, A League of Their Own. See, 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter writes this to the early church. He says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if some strange thing were happening to you. Instead, be glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Challenge and suffering are a part of the process in life. Listen, life wasn't designed that way. Have you read Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2? That's not how it began. Sin entered the world according to Genesis chapter 3. 
and we see throughout the remainder of God's word until you get to those last two chapters of the book of Revelation of God righteously dealing with sin. Life is not perfect. We, we live in a world that could be marred and riddled by sin. The, thus, life's not always easy. Maybe this theologian you know, Michael Scott, he says, life's not, it's not like I have to be like, need to be like, like to be like. Like, that's not who life's always for. Like, that's not the dynamics of life that always produce a healthy, vibrant life. Life doesn't always align with what fits your desired schedule or dreams and desires. Life's not always fun and a fruit-bearing season. Sometimes what God wants to do in your life in the moment is a bit of pruning. When you're walking through those seasons, don't fall into that temptation to see all of life as that season. Sometimes life with the Lord is extremely fruitful and extremely fun. And then sometimes he says, you know, now it's time for the valley. Now it's time to cut away. There's going to be challenge in your walk with the Lord. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Walking with the Lord. Maybe you remember this lesson we learned a few months ago. My worst day with Jesus beats any and every day without Jesus. And you have to keep that as a baseline. We're going to heaven. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We're given the fellowship of the saints. We're given God's word for instruction. But that does not negate the dynamics that sometimes walking with the Lord is challenging. God is developing you. He's working on you. Life is not as it was meant to be. There's sin in the world. Don't allow challenge to knock you on your heels and go, wait, what is this? I didn't know standing strong with Jesus would involve challenge. Yes, there will be seasons of challenge in walking with the Lord. He says in these verses, you're destined for this. See, standing strong with the Lord involves care, character, challenge. But point number four, caution. And I know what you're thinking. Neil, it's almost five till ten. We're only halfway through. Don't worry. The rest of these kind of fall like dominoes. Don't, it's going to work out. <laughs> caution. Caution. He, in verse 5, he says this. That is why, when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. See, I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. Standing strong with Jesus, please listen to this, involves an element of caution. An element of caution. Paul had a concern. How are those friends, how are those Christians doing in Thessalonica? I know the surrounding community is hard. I know we have this enemy who's out to, and after them. He calls him the tempter. He says, Timothy, go and see how they're doing. See if the tempter, has he gotten the best of them? Are they still walking with the Lord? Satan is truly the enemy of God's people. This is why I say this. You need to, you need to walk through life with an element of caution, awareness of this. How many of you would agree that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world? Amen. Yes. It's not like it's Darth Vader and Obi-Wan. You're like, who's going to win? You know, like, no. God is the creator. Satan is the created. Amen. It's not like there's this cosmic battle between light and darkness, and you just hope that light kind of ekes it out. No, not at all. God has a plan. He's in control. But there is an enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we see as a roaring lion. The word of God describes Satan. He stalks believers. Genesis chapter 3, Satan tempts Eve, attempting to weaken her faith in God by causing her to doubt or to wonder about what God's word actually said, saying, has God really said? One author put it this way. Satan often flatters the believer in order to lead them astray. Satan told Eve she would be like God if she ate of the tree, and she fell for his flattery. Satan is more dangerous when he flatters than when he frowns, this author said. See, what do you mean by that? 
I think we should walk circumspectly with an element of caution, knowing that we have an enemy who would love to destroy us. Let me give you an illustration. Here's how I would illustrate it. It'd be this first picture of this dog named Ollie. There's Ollie. A, a few months ago, and there's little Laney. Now, this is what Ollie looks like now, just about, oh, three weeks ago. <laughs> Got his first haircut. And the kids did not recognize this dog. It took Laney a few days to realize, oh, this is the same dog that I terrorize consistently and constantly. But Ollie is somewhat new to our home. And as you saw in that first picture, Laney adores him and abuses him every chance she can get. She just goes up and grabs that nose, takes her hand, put it in the mouth. And Ollie is a sweet dog. He just takes it. He just, he's just happy to have someone to, that's interested in him. As you saw in that first picture, she just sits on him. I mean, she's got that fiery red personality, and she sometimes just pulls. And we have gentle Laney, gentle Laney, gentle. We have to be a little bit circumspect when Laney's around him. But there's another dynamic about Ollie that we have to be cautious with. He's a puppy, eight months old. Anyone ever known a puppy, met a puppy? I'm learning about puppies. They love to chew on things, not things that you buy for them to chew. Things that they buy, you buy, they just sit there. But the things that you don't want him to chew, you hide them, you put them wherever, they somehow find them. And so in our home, here's the question. Is Ollie in the house? Like, we always ask that, is he, where is he? We got to know where he is. Because if it's quiet, it's not good. You know, something is going on. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. Now, I don't think you should be looking for the devil under every rock. Do you know what I mean by that? But there should be a sense of caution. Wait, there's an enemy who wants to destroy me. I need to be aware of that. Like in our dynamic, my wife drives a um, kind of a mid-top size 15 passenger transit van. Um, and yeah, that's what we do. That's our situation. Um, and so when you get on the interstate, if it's a little breezy, a little windy, or you come alongside a semi truck, it's very easy for that dynamic to kind of cause that van. If you're not careful, if you're not aware, to fishtail a little bit. If you're just cruising, say, man, I'm in the 15 passenger. The windows are tented. We got this. And semis are coming by. It's very easy for you to get off track. This is what I'm trying to say. This is what I'm trying to share. We're living in a time where it seems like the enemy is setting multitudinous cultural landmines. And we need to use wisdom and caution not to step in, set off, or become enraptured in them in any other message other than the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's so easy to find ourselves engaged in something. Go, Man, is, is this taking our focus off who Jesus is and what he wants done? There's an element of caution that's necessary for your walk with the Lord, for your love for the Lord, to, to stay and to stand strong. Walk circumspectly. As other New Testament writers would say, stay alert, watch out. He prowls like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Don't let that freak you out. Let that just give you awareness to your surroundings. See, standing strong with Jesus involves care, character. There's challenge. There's caution. Point number five. There's need for good communication. Look at verse 6. But now Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. Paul cares enough to communicate. He's sending Timothy to get word. He's interested about his friends. So what does he do? He reaches out. Listen to what some authors write about communication. Communication to a relationship is like oxygen to life. Does anyone know what happens to life without oxygen? It dies. Another author wrote this. Without communication, there is no relationship. A relationship without communication is just two people. Many problems in the world would be solved if we talk to instead of about one another. It's so true. Relationships thrive on good communication. How do you know that? God values it. Look how much he's communicated to you and I. He wants you to know his heart and his will. 
God values good communication, and Paul and Timothy and the Thessalonians cared enough for one another to communicate. To communicate. See, we don't stand strong in Jesus in isolation, but in communication and in community with one another. And one of the greatest ways to strengthen and maintain relationship is just to talk to one another. Standing and staying with Jesus, a lot of it simply just involves you knowing his word, being in it. Now, I don't know if you know this, but there's a church that cares about you and wants you to be daily in the word. So they put together this program for you, Monday through Friday, two-minute devotion and a little reading plan. That's for your benefit and for your good. This is one of the greatest stabilizers in your walk with the Lord is just simply staying in good communication with your Creator, knowing His Word. Knowing His Word. Care, character, challenge, caution, communication. Next, we'll see in verse 7, this need for consistency. Don't worry, we're almost through. Consistency. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in the faith. They just hung in there. If we're going to be successful in something, this is the key. Just staying consistent. You know, I read it recently about a conversation that Pastor Greg Laurie had with Pastor Chuck Smith before he went to heaven. I wanted to read to you what was recorded here about this conversation. This is in Greg Laurie's voice. He says this, Not long before Pastor Chuck went to heaven, I had lunch with him. And as we were eating, he said, I have one question for you. If an older Chuck could speak to a younger Chuck, what would you say to yourself? What is the message you would pass on to this younger version of you? And Greg writes that he looked up and very simply said, hold the course. And they said, then he went back to his meal. And I thought, hold the course, he said. What does that mean? He said, does that mean like just keep doing what you're doing? Right. (laughs) Okay, so just like keep reading, keep praying, just keep walking with the Lord. Right. Hold the course. Consistency. Just staying faithful to what God has called you to do. Walking with him, reading his word, giving to him, fellowshipping with his people. Just walking with him. One step at a time, one day at a time. See, standing strong in Jesus involves care, character, challenge, caution, communication, consistency, but also the need for comfort. Verse 8, he says, it gives us new life to know that you're standing firm in the Lord. How we thank God for you because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Comfort. In verse 7, their consistency, their, their team encouragement brought joy to the Apostle Paul. You know, fatigue in anything is a natural element in life. And we need one another. Need to see one another's journey, be encouraged by their presence. And that's what Paul says here. Man, I just get so much comfort from seeing what God is doing in you. You know, there's such a question right now in the 21st century is, is this still necessary post-COVID? Like, is this in-person dynamic of Christians, is it really a thing? Can't we just do this on the metaverse? Paul writes this. Let us, or not actually Paul, but the author of Hebrews writes this. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. We're designed as human beings to be connected, not to be isolated. And this is what Paul writes. Paul, the guy who just writes stuff and it becomes Bible, the guy that plants churches, the guy that gets big rocks thrown at him almost to the point of death and he just gets back up, brushes himself off and gets back in there and preaches some more. He says, you know what brought me comfort is your example. Hearing about what God is doing. 
Pastor Joe mentioned this a few moments ago about the fall starting and how connect groups will be starting back up. Shared about a men's breakfast that'll be happening, a canoe trip next weekend. These are meant to be dynamics in which for us to connect, build relationships, and encourage one another. And if you want to stand strong in Jesus, here's the thing you need from time to time. People just need to see what's going on in your life. It brings comfort. It brings encouragement. Paul said, listen, to just hear how you're standing, how you're staying with Jesus, it brought such comfort to me. Verse 10. We see what we could say the eighth and final element of standing strong with Jesus. Cheer. C-H-E-E-R. He says this. Night and day we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again, to fill the gaps in your faith. It's almost like you can hear the exuberance of Paul as he's writing these words to these Christians in Thessalonica whom he loved. It's like he's saying, I'm cheering you on. I'm cheering you on. You know, I, I really do believe that everyone needs a Ricky Ryan in their life. Now, you may not know who that is, but there was a time in my life when I was serving at a church on the West Coast, and my pastor's name, Pastor Ricky, was this just broad-shouldered, silver-haired. He called himself the, uh, the Santa Claus pastor almost sometimes, because when you would see him, he'd be filled with so much joy. And he'd always ask you this question, Lucas, are you stoked? you would be like, what? What do you mean? Am I stoked? What? He would always be there to encourage and bring cheer to another person. And I think for Paul, he received that comfort from others and he sought to be that cheerleader for another. You know what sometimes brings resiliency to your own faith? Not being so consumed about your story, but someone else's. And say, listen, how can I cheer you on in what God's doing in your life, in your ministry, and what God's doing in your family? cheer. Paul and the team wanted to give, give, give to the people in Thessalonica. Not always pointing out weaknesses, but pointing to fruit, pointing to progress. I mean, he recognizes in that verse, yeah, there's some gaps in the faith that we're going to help bring to, but listen, we're praying for you. We're excited to see you. To bring cheer to another person in return brings that ability for yourself to stand and to stay with Jesus in a place that's healthy. See, let me see if I can rattle these off again. Here's the eight. You're thinking, man, we did it. We made it, and we still got 22 minutes. This is phenomenal. But standing strong in Jesus involves care, character, challenge, a necessary element of caution, communication, consistency, comfort, and cheer. And I'll add two more just for good measure because they're kind of in the context of this text. Number nine, I would say community. You see that all over the place. That's what church is by definition. A, a gathering, a group, a, a, those that are called out to for and around Jesus. Community. We don't stand strong in Jesus alone, but with one another. And the 10th and final one would be this, control. Not you taking control, but trusting and knowing that God is in control. And you can trust him. And that what, that's what gives that ability to stick and stay and stand with Jesus is that the Lord knows. It's that simple. That simple faith that he is in control and in charge and working out his plan. I love that next Sunday we get to step back into that survey, that study of the book of Revelation where we'll learn more about that plan that he has. But standing strong in Jesus involves all these things, care, communication, challenge, caution, cheer, comfort, recognizing he's in control. And where does this lead us? I'd say the 11th and final C. We can chill out and trust Jesus that he knows what's going on. And that's what brings serenity of soul, knowing that he is in control, that he's got this, that I can trust him, that maybe like Timothy, I'm, I'm called to do my part. Lord, I want character. I want that to be the thing that I prize in my life. People, I, I want that to be my pride and my joy. 
Here's the great thing about that. No matter your history, your family background, your competency level, your education, you can excel in being rich in relationships and character. And they yield some of the greatest returns on investment in all of life's endeavors. Standing and staying and sticking in love with Jesus, it's walking with him, doing the things you know that he's called you to do, and resting in the fact, we'll use the C just because that's our alliterated letter for this morning, chilling out and knowing, God, you've got this. I can trust you. I just want to walk with you. 